Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, we're talking about energy in America today. More specifically, we're talking about the attack on the colonial pipeline. Um, and this is pretty serious business. When we have serious business, we call on Max. Max Pizier, he's a researcher for ePrint uh, in Washington, D.C., and he joins us from there. Hi, Max. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jay. It's, uh, it's always great to uh, have, have a lively conversation with you about uh, topics of, of immediate interest. Well, the Colonial Pipeline is really uh, interesting in the sense that it, it opens up possibilities and risks. Maybe it reveals things that we weren't really thinking about, you know, uh, in terms of the national conversation. And so this is a teaching experience, even though it seems to have been resolved, at least for now. So can you talk about what happened here and, and, what, and what the significance of this pipeline is? Um, well, in the context of the Colonial Pipeline, um, things began happening on Friday, uh, May 7th. Uh, you had a complete shutdown of the system. Um, the, uh, the announcements were terse, but you had a complete shutdown uh, of the system uh, because it was announced that one of Colonial System's IT, corporate IT systems, was uh, the target of ransomware. Uh, as a precaution, uh, the whole system was taken down by the company to make sure that none of the other controlling systems, uh, the, the control infrastructure across the whole expanse of the pipeline, um, they were also disabled. So that you could do a full check of every, every system. Uh, the significance of the colonial system is, is that uh, you have geographical uh, mismatches across the United States. I, I don't know how, uh, if, if how this is, is experienced in Hawaii, but um, you have a bounty of of, uh, of resources in one area, and you have uh, a lack in another, and you have to mitigate the, you, know, you, you have consuming centers, you have producing centers. Um, one of the more efficient ways of doing that is via pipeline. So you have uh, petrol, uh, crude oil production, um, crude oil imports, uh, refining, um, at least half of, of all of that located right along the U.S. Gulf Coast. Um, on the East Coast, you have uh, the huge population centers from Atlanta all the way up to New York City, points further north, Rochester, Boston, whatever. Uh, beginning in the late 1930s, it was recognized that possibly a more efficient way than, than, than um, uh, cargo ships uh, tanker ships, it would be uh, more efficient to move things via product pipeline. Uh, you had one of the first pipelines that set up in 1938. Um, with the war, you uh, still had uh, lots of uh, tankers moving from the Gulf Coast to uh, the East Coast, but you had all of these German submarines attacking uh, product tankers, so you had a shortage in the East Coast as you were preparing for the, preparing the war effort. Consequently, uh, certain smart people within the, uh, the FDR administration saw uh, to building um, some of the first product pipelines. The was this part of the WPA, the uh, effort that he made uh, to uh, resurrect the economy in the late 30s? I think the, plan, the first one, uh, the plantation one in 1938 was. Um, that, that's now operated by uh, an entity known as Kinder Morgan. Uh, by the beginning of the 19, uh, late 19, by the end of the late 1950s, it was, you know, seen that there's going to be a surge in, in uh, requirements for fuel. You don't have the refineries on the East Coast. You have terminals. How do we get the fuel from uh, Texas to uh, the East Coast in a more efficient way? So it, beginning in 1961 and completed in 1964, the Colonial Pipeline was built. Uh, originating in Houston and going all the way up to New York Harbor with spurs that uh, came out at various points, Atlanta, uh, North, uh, Raleigh, Durham, uh, North Carolina, Philadelphia, et cetera, and it goes all the way up to um, uh, New York Harbor. Um, you know, when you think of a pipeline like that going through a city, that's a big project. You got to dig a hole all the way through the city. And, <laughs> no. you, know, you have other kinds of infrastructure that same part of the city, you know, uh, sewer, um, uh, you know, electrical cables, telecommunications cables, 
whatever it is, and um, you, you really have a, a job ahead of you. But you were telling me before the show that in those days, you were able to build a pipeline at a great distance, a very quick time. Uh, and life was different then. Yeah, can you right. talk about that? Right. And well, yeah, the pipeline that I cited uh, that was built in the middle of the war, it was known as the ancient Megan. That was built within a, within a year and a half. The colonial project was, was considerably larger. Um, it's, a, a, it's a braid. Let's think of it as a, a braid running from Houston. Two different pipelines, one primarily gasoline, the other one primarily diesel and jet fuel. Uh, I mean, you, you were on the cusp of a, a, a huge expansionary period um, in the history of the United States. Uh, we were the beneficiaries of uh, commercials every Sunday evening on the Bonanza see the USA and the Chevrolet. So somehow to get fuel in that Chevrolet, you needed gasoline. Uh, while you had pipelines that, I, I'm sorry, a refineries in the East Coast that produced gasoline, you needed a lot more to get in that Chevrolet to go across the United States or just you know wherever it is that you're going. Um, so governments uh, that, that re the permitting, the, uh, the easements that were required, uh, all of that was, uh, uh, in a much, I can't think of the right term, but it was, it was, permitting wasn't as constricted or as a challenge as it is in the current moment. Uh, the, well, also, you, you, in those days, you didn't have um, activist opposition the way you do now, especially about pipelines. Right. So. Ralph Nader was only beginning his career with the Corvair. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, it's, uh, he, and he didn't spawn a whole uh, bunch of Ralph Nader wannabes. Um, and pipelines weren't, weren't, weren't the target at that time. Uh, in the current moment, pipelines are, are uh, you know, every pipeline, every pipeline development is a struggle. Um, but I, I don't know if I sufficiently uh, answered your question. Well, I, let's talk about the operational aspects of the colonial pipeline, which, which led into its vulnerability uh, for this attack. Okay. Uh, Great question, great, great, uh, great topic. Um, uh, as time marches on, and, and I hate to say time really does march on, um, yeah, where you had operators uh, along the, uh, the the length of the pipeline, uh, somebody with a phone uh, sitting there at a uh, uh, compression station, uh, something like that, that has been eliminated, has been eliminated in favor of. Uh, all of these systems are now uh, more and more computerized. And they're computerized not just by a private network into a private network, it, it connects into the internet. Um, and with this ubiquity of, of so many uh, connected devices, uh, you have a central location that monitors all these things. But if you're not vigilant um, for all the uh, malevolent and malicious activity that takes place on the internet, uh, you can be compromised very much in, in the way that uh, the colonial pipeline was compromised uh, over the last five days. Why, well, why do you need these uh, stations and internet connections anyway? It, why don't you just put the oil through the pipe and let, let it come out the other side? Why do, why, do I, <laughs> why do I need digital technology for that? Well, you know, uh, in, the, in the case of, in the case of the Colonial, it's, it's not a crude oil pipeline, it's a product pipeline. And there's a nuance to these things. I mean, you're not just putting one type of stuff through it. Uh, a, a, a product pipeline is, is an ingenious uh, uh, development. Uh, you know, we, we really, whoever did thought of this, it, uh, we, we should commend them highly. But it, you know, consider it, it you're moving fuels and you're moving a lot of different fuels through just one system, through one thread. How do you do it? Well, you put a certain kind of gasoline in the pipeline and you have to push it. Well, maybe not everybody wants this 5 million barrels of gasoline. We also need to move uh, diesel. So you use diesel to push the gasoline. And there's uh, uh, the, the two, two things uh, mix and you have to be able to identify and extract that. That's called a transmix. Um, transportation mixture. Um, if you're moving two different kinds of gasoline, uh, a higher octane and a lower octane, again, you have to identify the uh, lower grade component and know what to do with it. Uh, and that's, that's 
that's where the uh, complications come in. And something like a, a, a computerized system um, creates certain efficiencies. You know, you, you can have the operator there sit at, uh, you know, at some sort of a wheel and, and make adjustments to the, to, the, to the pipeline, but they can have a bad day. They can go out and get a bad tuna fish sandwich. And <laughs> that, that, that'll just, you know, disrupt things. Whereas with a computer, if anything, if it makes mistakes, it'll be consistent mistakes. If it make if it does everything right, it'll be done consistent. Um, and that's the the advantage that's seen in a, in a computerized network. So if I if I take it offline, if I terminate the um, you know the the digital technology, the computer functionality on this pipe that, that separates the uh, shipments, the uh, transfers of different kinds of uh, product, what happens? We have chaos. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, it, there was uh, uh, a perfect storm of that. It was, uh, uh, we have California, we have Texas, and now we have uh, uh, what's going on in the south, southeastern part of the United States. Um, there were enough announcements. Uh, people became concerned. They didn't uh, uh, trust uh, some of these. Uh, uh, you know, people said, well, we'll be back in a few days. You had panic buying. and just the photographs that show up on Twitter are, are pretty astonishing as far as how, how much hoarding that uh, took place by some people. Uh, so you had panic buying. And so consequently, in the state of, uh, in, in, in Atlanta, 50% of the filling stations don't have any gasoline. Um, you have this going all the way up from the state of Georgia to southern New Jersey. Right now, 1% of this, uh, um, the, the filling stations in New Jersey don't have a guy gasoline. But you, you start going points further south, um, it goes to 20, 50. State of Virginia, 60% of the uh, filling stations don't have any gasoline. And that's what happened over the last five days. A lot of sorry. that is attributed to, I'm sorry, uh, a lot of that is attributed to the, the, to the panic, uh, to the hoarding. But um, it, it also shows you the, uh, the vulnerability on such a, a large system and, uh, what what uh, could possibly jeopardize one small thing? It's say like a butterfly in a cloud causes uh, a rainstorm, uh, a thunderstorm of huge magnitude in Argentina. So something like this, some entrepreneurial hackers just wanting to extort some money suddenly uh, created a, a huge mess that uh, affected an area of about 100 million people. Wow, that is remarkable. You know, it reminds me, <clears throat> to, to dwell a moment on this, it reminds me of uh, the, the Northeast um, Carter back in the 70s. Spencer Abram was the Secretary of Energy at the time. <clears throat> and um, it went down, the grid went down. Oh, yeah. And so you had, you know, again, 100 million people all without electricity because all the, grid, all the grids were connected. And they were down, and uh, so he was. Uh, he was on the media, you know. And they said, "How could you let this happen?" And he said, "Let me explain. If you don't pay attention to the infrastructure, it doesn't last forever. It fails." And in this case, uh, you know, the country built the infrastructure. I don't know, the fifties maybe, <clears throat> and it was getting old and it failed. What can you do if you don't renew it? Right. So. Uh, um, I'm wondering here if this could have been hardened. You know, they say that the uh, you know the Texas grid system could have been built better, uh, and it could have been interconnected and so forth. Um, and if if money had been put in, they didn't want to do it. But if money had been put in to to building that system better and harder, um, their recent uh, debacle would not have happened. Um, can you say the same thing about Colonial Pipeline? Uh, could they have avoided this in some way by, you know, putting in more modern infrastructure, and that would include electronics? Right. I I, I think so. Um, yeah. I, without knowing uh, all the details of uh, the events that have taken place over the last five days, um, certainly it the the internet, uh, corporate uh, computer set systems both at the corporate level and at the operational level, they're heterogeneous. You have many different system administrators. 
Um, some of these system administrators, they're, they're true virtuosos. They, 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 I, I, you know, having been in IT myself and looked over some of these people's shoulders and, and, and watched, uh, you know, they, they, they continually refine their knowledge. They continually work uh, uh, to better understand what the capabilities of the system are, what, what are the new threats. There are others that take, uh, that are not as focused, let's say, to be generous. Um, so it's, it's, I think in this case, there was a weak link and, uh, uh, one corporate system, uh, perhaps, uh, at the executive level was compromised. Um, certain data was acquired, uh, because get, understanding how, how these hackers work, that so I'm assuming that's how it was done. Um, uh, that was where the vulnerability was. And whoever uh, was managing that one particular system across the whole colonial network, um, I, I think that was the, uh, the Achilles heel. Yeah. Uh, leave it to the Greeks to give us a great uh, 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 metaphor for uh, what took place. <laughs> well, so in this case, um, what happens is um, <clears throat> uh, they, they received a ransom demand and uh at least at some management level somebody decided hey wait we are we are not going to be flat-footed on this or at least we're going to minimize our uh, damage here so we'll, we'll turn it all off we're going to turn everything off and and check out can you talk about that how that happened well um you know it's it's an intrusion into a system somebody comes into your house you don't know if they just stayed in the kitchen or if they went into every room uh, and I think that that's what the precaution was uh, that was taken by uh, by Colonial, and that's a tribute to um, that that's a tribute to the to the uh, system administrators who under, understood the uh, the level of threat. It's not just one system that that might have been affected; it might be uh, 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 company wide in every every uh, division of uh, uh, that exists across the board. Yeah, and it's, it's like uh, the metaphor is they could still be in the house, ready to ready to do more. You know, still inside the system, uh, ready to go to step two and three and four and really make a wreck out of it. Right, absolutely. So I mean, so in, in that way, it's uh, uh, you know, once you once you're you've compromised the network and you're in the network itself, um, then every network that you touch makes it appear that. It's only the person from the compromised position, not from outside of the network. Uh, so it looks like the actor is within the system, not outside of the system. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what you want to, to diagnose and prevent. Mm -hmm. Now, you said uh, that there were some jurisdictional issues around uh, what happened and the response to it. What were the jurisdictional issues? Well, um, they obviously, uh, we have regulatory authorities. Uh, those regulatory authorities um, have jurisdiction over certain kinds of things. We have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that has jurisdiction over the natural gas pipeline and over the electrical system, but they have no jurisdiction over the product pipeline. Colonial being a product pipeline is not under uh, their, their oversight. FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is particularly vigilant and particularly uh, they're not they're they're very good at, at at enforcement. If they see a flaw, they'll let you know right away. Um, the enforcement, the uh, jurisdiction for the product pipelines comes out of the Department of Transportation. There is uh, an agency that um, has a difficult acronym, PIMSA, uh, Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Agency. And they have jurisdiction over the, uh, the product pipeline. And where you have an established set of standards uh, for the natural gas pipelines, you have something like management by suggestion uh, or, or regulation by suggestion for the product pipeline. Uh, you have one more division within um, the Department of Transportation that makes recommendations as to what the product pipeline operators should do. They don't say, you have to, they just say, well, maybe you should try this uh, to make it work. And there's no enforcement authority. So um, yeah. in, in this current case, it's hard to say whether uh, there should be stronger enforcement. 
Uh, but if anything, it exposes that there's a lack of uniformity. Um, and, and that takes us to the whole notion of security. Is this kind of attack hasn't happened on an infrastructure of this magnitude before. I mean, I, I'd be worried about it, but here it is. We, we're facing a new reality. Exactly. And so let's assume that it was a state actor who could get this together. Um, why does Russia come to mind? Um, or maybe other countries, but it's a state actor, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And and so we have to be prepared for this to happen again. Other uh, attempts or attacks will, will follow uh, and be possible. So how do you deal with this now? Do we need, what do we need in order to, you know, beef up our systems and uh, minimize the risk of another attack? Well, you know, obviously we, we need efficiency. Uh, uh, you need some centralization in the authority. You need um, some efficiency in the, uh, 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 sorry, sometimes there's just a lack of a word, uh, in the delegation uh, of, of information. Um, you need coherent standards. You need uh, to update those standards consistently. You need to be able to broadcast the threat across a wide group consistently. Uh, it, it, something that hasn't happened during, in this COVID period right now, where you had so many different messages at so many different points in time. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Um, in this case, it's the uh, uh, same sort of thing, as far, at least with the product pipelines. I mean, there's- But well, somebody has to take a look at this. Right. Seems absolutely. to me, <clears throat> we can't afford to have this on a regular basis, and, and we certainly have to minimize the risk going forward. Because look, look at the damage. In this case, luckily, um, you know, they they acted preemptively by turning the system off. Could have been worse. You know? Yes. Um, so let's look at your slides. You had some slides. I wonder if we could flip through them and uh, and learn from that. A map of the United States. Uh, a lot of colored lines. The uh, colonial pipeline is shown in uh, a much broader blue, and there's an arrow emphasizing uh, the direction of flow. Uh, critically, it's it's a huge pipeline in terms of capacity. It can move uh, three million up to three million barrels uh, per day of product. Uh, at, just to give you context, uh, the East Coast, uh, all the states they west of the Appalachian, from uh, Florida up to Maine, that whole area consumes about 6 million uh, barrels per day of product. So half of that comes out of the U.S. Gulf Coast along, uh, along the Colonial. Some of the other lines that you see there uh, are the other product pipelines uh, that, that service other regions of the United States. If this went on for an extended period of time, some of those the capacity in those pipelines might be leveraged depending on, on, on what's available. So you could reroute product through, through those other systems. Um, but Colonial is the, it's, it's the big dog. Just, just for curiosity, if I went on that line and I looked at, physically at the pipe, which would be buried or you know, in a remote area and, and, and protected in some way, how big would the pipe be? What's the diameter of a pipe in, in this pipeline? I think it's about 30 inches. Um, 30 inches, okay. Right. That's enough to, if it runs continuously, that's enough to service uh, 100 million consumers. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. and, and, and the map that you saw was uh, something that I created. The lines themselves aren't particularly distinct, and that's with intention. The, uh, the source of the information is the U.S. government, and especially with the product pipelines, they want to blur exactly where they overlap um, on, the, sure. uh, on the map. It's the same thing with telecommunications uh, landing areas. You don't want to tell the public where it is because you're asking for sabotage. Exactly. And uh, pipeline is a, a, a great target for sabotage, just as this was. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this slide simply enumerates the events and, and some of the possible um, repercussions. Uh, one point uh, that I think I make here is, is that if if say this this extended for another week or another two weeks or maybe it went out for a month you would have the experience that took place uh in texas with hurricane harvey and uh um, apologies early senility setting in but i think this was august uh 2017. um 20 
And, and with these all these secondary effects, no, we're talking exactly. about hospitals, people are, who absolutely require the gas for one thing or another. Exactly. You, can, you can make a list that'd be as long as your arm. Uh, right. But, but one question that flows from that is, um, so they got it back together again. Today, I think they got it back together. Uh, and that means they went through the system. They, they wanted to make sure that there was nothing else lurking in there. And they knew the, the scope of the problem. And then they turned on the computers again and, and effectively rebooted the electronic. And, 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 then, and, yeah, and started the, you know, the physical aspect of the pipeline, uh, yeah. pushing product through the pipeline. And just to give yeah. you a context of how fast things go, um, if I can tell this to you anecdotally, uh, we visited a, one, one pipeline operator in the middle of Pennsylvania. And he says, you know, if I put the jet fuel in here and it goes up to Rochester and I start walking today, and I'll be up in Rochester in about a week, I'll be in Rochester just about the time that uh, uh, the jet fuel that I've injected into the pipeline here. So to get to put it in uh, uh, more formal parameters, the flow is relatively slow. It's five miles per hour. So it, it's, you're pushing a huge mass. Um, and it takes a considerable amount of time to get stuff from Texas uh, at five miles an hour into uh, New York Harbor. So all these states in the South, uh, you know, and suffered a a lack of gas for their gas stations and other facilities, they're not going to see uh, full capacity for at least a few days. Huh? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But at least yeah. they know it's coming. So, yeah. Hopefully it'll take the edge off the panic because the yeah. panic really, uh, uh, it, it, I mean, just seeing some of this, uh, the, the lines were reminiscent uh, of the 70s, uh, 70, uh, 74 and 79. Um, and and just some of the uh, uh, the crazy scenes. There was a, a picture of an S, uh, a, a couple with an SUV, a huge SUV, and they had all these red plastic gasoline containers, and they were filling them up and stacking them in the trunk uh, uh, part of uh, the SUV. Um, just uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, uh, it's more gasoline than you'll you'll probably ever need for the next month and a half. It's hoarding. It's hoarding and, and maybe it's uh, capitalizing on the problem, you know, and right. maybe reselling it to people who didn't have any gas. That's really awful. Right. <clears throat> but that's what happens in a panic. You can right. count on that. The same thing would happen with water. The same thing would happen with food, actually. And therefore, our infrastructure is so important. And, and I hope that uh, this has some effect on Congress in terms of passing the infrastructure bill. I imagine there must be some money earmarked to deal with this very kind of problem in that bill. Well, uh, it's interesting that you say that because uh, uh, you know politicians don't meet a uh, don't miss a crisis uh, when, when it starts happening. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know the finger pointing start, came out, but also uh, this week you, you already have hearings scheduled uh, that are going to, especially on the Senate side, that are, are going to broach uh, this particular topic. Uh, Energy and public works, uh, environment and natural resources. They all, if it's not the main committee, it's it's the subcommittees that are uh, draw attention to uh, to this particular issue. Um, one one thing is, uh, you know, you mentioned that this is a company that we we know the name of the company. It's called Darkside Capital D A R K Capital S I D E, but we don't know who runs it or where it's from or exactly, uh, you know, how we could you know, identify it and stop it. But um, query, what do we know about this? And um, what is the possibility of catching people who do this sort of thing? Uh, or can we just, you know, write off a solution? I mean, assume that there is no solution and we just have to be defensive, that the only move we can make is defensive. Um, well, it, 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 your, your question raises a number of, of issues about this sort of thing. Uh, one uh, is that uh, these entities have gone after relatively considerably smaller and less visible targets, hospital systems, um, Lady Gaga's uh, private information, um, things of that nature. They've never hit uh, a system of this particular scale. So by hitting a system of this particular scale, that brings in the attention of uh, entities like the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, uh, people who have a vested interest in protecting the, uh, the borders of the United States and the Constitution. So uh, that 
that was sort of a mistake on their part because they identified themselves so uh, clearly. Um, so they can do it. You know, you know what strikes me is uh, you know, one, one thought would flow is that they didn't really care about the ransom. That was a cover. They really cared about disrupting the country. Because let me, let me just pose it to you and see what you think. Because they knew that this had to be made public. Uh, and certainly it was a public spectacular. And if it was made public, the public would not tolerate paying a ransom. That would that would be politically, you know, indefensible to actually pay the ransom. So I think you know a, a reasonable state actor at least would know that this this is not going to result in a, you know, in a ransom. Um, at the same time, um, you know, good for the government or whoever made that decision. Good for Colonial to say no, because if Colonial had paid the ransom. My goodness, don't you think we'd be having more of the same? Well, I'm not sure Colonial didn't pay the ransom because uh, given the way the, uh, uh, there was a press conference yesterday uh, in the White House and two of the advisors to uh, uh, President Biden were up there. One from, uh, oh, one was a deputy national security advisor. And the, I forget uh, the other lady, uh, I think she was Homeland. Um, the deputy national security advisor, when she was, when the question was presented to her about advising on paying, not paying the ransom, they said, we don't make those kinds of recommendations. Um, there, this is a commercial operation. It's up to them whether or not they want to pay the, uh, the uh, ransom. I, I find that a little peculiar that, uh, um, uh, I, I mean, the, you know, this, 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 this definitely rises to the level of criminality. I mean, not not, not just uh, uh, a misdemeanor, and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, that sort of ambivalence stated at the executive level uh, seemed to send send a message. There's something behind behind the scenes there. I, I agree with you. What right. has to ask about? It. So we're out of time, actually, Max. But I know you have more slides. Maybe we can get to it in another show because maybe, okay. maybe this will happen again. But I. I only want to ask you one more question to close, and that is, you, you gave me some, call them anecdotes, the one about a Latin American scenario. And uh, I wonder if you could just tell that story and then we'll close. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't want to disclose uh, the, the company or, uh, or other, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, masking some of these things, but... Uh, uh, Eprink uh, is friends and knows of a company that deals in industrial products. These are control systems um, on things like pipelines. And uh, they sold them under license to a certain uh, Latin American country that has uh, petroleum interests. Uh, these petroleum interests are monitored and controlled by them uh, from the, the headquarters of this Midwestern company at, in their Midwestern city. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Latin American country did not pay its monthly bill. And this is maybe going on eight or nine months. Um, and finally, the frustration of the co company was such that uh, they decided from that their own headquarters, they were going to shut down systems remotely several thousand miles to the south uh, be, as a signal to say, Listen, we, we would like uh, to get our, our uh, comp to be compensated for the services that we've rendered, and we're tired of waiting eight or nine months. I mean, we do have our own bill to pay. So um, what, what that underscores is that uh, the centrality and how much you can control over the internet. But the flip side of it is too, is if you compromise that, that console operation in that Midwestern city, uh, then you have exposed not just the Latin American country, but every network that uh, these people have access to. Which could be anywhere in the world. Exactly, exactly, yes. Well, that's, hey. that's comforting, Max. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean the, I don't the sour note, but anywhere in the world where this, this organization has operations that they can control. We're in a new time. It's every time you look, there's something happens that has never happened before. And, um, you know, it's all a combination of events, technology, and... And the way the world works is the world is not only flat, it's, it's sometimes uh, upside down. <laughs> Definitely upside down. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah.
Yeah, Max, Max Pizier of uh, Ebrink joining us from Washington, talking about the colonial pipeline, and what happened and what the lessons are. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you, Jay. Always great to be with you. Uh, to have this conversation. Aloha.